the longest time to figure out where in the world to find that. Thing. But I finally did, and now just about every day when I open up the community section, I, I look up that uh, particular column and find a, a good laugh for many days. And this is the first time I think I'm using one in my message. So uh, you might have seen this, Don, I'm not sure. But there was a the trouble with the paper, I think maybe Monday or Tuesday of this week, it was about a teacher who was asking her students if they had ever broken a bone. And she asked them uh, who had had a lot of pain from that broken bone. All the kids did, except for one lone young lady in her class. I'm curious how this went, and the girl experienced no pain. She asked her, my dear, which bone did you break? And the little one says, my brother's. <laughs> Children 
and to correct Mother Nature when somebody feels that they've been born with the wrong body. And the long term of effects on society just cannot be known yet. And here's an example of this, maybe a strange example, but nonetheless one that they found to be uh, uh, quite true. Two economists have discovered that the freedom to shop on Sundays contributes significantly to wicked behavior. Any of you know that that was a fact? The, this, is, this is even more of an irony. The people most affected are the ones who are the most religious. Jonathan Gruber and Daniel Hungerman are the ones who have studied what happens when states have repealed blue laws. You know what I'm talking about. Those are the statutes that prohibit the sale of non-essential items like appliances and furniture, cars, jewelry, liquor, and such. And there's still vestiges of those blue laws in West Virginia. You know, you have to wait till 1 o'clock to buy wine on Sundays. Isn't that a bummer? <laughs> but they're around. And many of us can remember a time when we didn't shop and work on Sunday very much. And most of those have been gone for a generation now. Uh, this research, though, has found that church attendance decreases when stores are open on Sunday while drinking and drug use increase. And the most striking is that the biggest change in bad behavior mostly occurs among those who have hitherto attended worship quite regularly. Before the shopping bans were lifted, 37% of people attended religious services at least weekly. And once stores were open on Sundays, attendance fell to 32%. See, there's a problem right there, isn't it? And instead of going to church, many of the faithful are going astray. Marijuana use increases among church attendees compared with those who never went to services, as does cocaine use and heavy drinking. And the researcher concluded, instead of being in church, you're working or shopping at the mall. And he suspects that the time at the mall, whether working or shopping, increases our exposure to sinners and surrounds us with many more party animals. Open the stores, they conclude, and all of a sudden, Sundays become sinful. The kid, like uh, the kids, who get their driver's license and then they wrap their car around their trees, we've got to learn how to handle the freedom that we are given in Jesus Christ. And into this discussion, Paul offers to us the contrast between living according to the flesh and living according to the Spirit of God as a clue to working through this dilemma of no longer being bound to the law. Now, what's he talking about when he says flesh? Flesh is a loaded term in Paul's writing. Sometimes I don't think it means the same thing. But I would just tell you that flesh basically would refer to our fallen. Or sinfulness. It might be a little bit too simplified, but I think it works for us today. Now, we aren't talking about bodily temptations only, like our appetites or our sex drive. When he's mentioning within these works of the flesh, jealousy and rage and envy, he's expanding the umbrella beyond just those appetites of the body and what they produce. To John Wesley's mother, Susanna, the stubborn flesh was the hardest battle for Christians to fight. And she felt that God the parents would do well to equip the children. She was going to equip hers to overcome the flesh early. She writes in her journal that one day one of her daughters wished to do something which wasn't entirely wrong, but in Susanna's mind wasn't right. I wish I would have known what she wanted to do, but she doesn't like that. Well, when the daughter was told not to do it, she wasn't convinced. And it was late, and she and her mother were sitting beside a dead fire. And her mother said to her, pick up that bit of coal. I don't want to, said the girl. Go on, said her mother. The fire's out. It's not going to burn me. It's not going to scorch. I know that, said the girl. I know it won't burn me, but it will blacken my hand. thing which you wish to do won't burn. It's not going to scorch you, but it will like Leave it alone. That's often how the flesh and its temptations parades itself as something that we should be free to do. It won't scorch us or anyone else, we think, forgetting how it will blacken, blacken our spirit, blacken our witness. N.T. Wright, in his commentary, puts it this way, 
that we are all born in a condition that we might call the flesh. We have human families. We have ethnic identities. And we all know, you know what's so special to us among that for us. And within us, we find all sorts of desires. And if those desires are given full sway over our lives, the results are not very pretty. Given their rightful corralling, they're okay. But letting them carry us away into drunkenness or sexual infidelity or gluttony, they're no longer good. They're no longer doing the good thing that God created them for. A place that's full of persons of such desires Filling such desires is not the sort of place that God wishes for this earth or for the kingdom of God when it arrives in its fullness. And that's why Paul says that persons who continue to do such things in the flesh will not be found inheriting the kingdom of God. Thankfully, though, praise God, what happens in our life is that the Spirit of God begins to go to work. And we as United Methodists believe there isn't a moment in our lives when the Spirit is not at work even long before that first sign of blooming faith is present and visible in our lives, God's Spirit has been wooing and calling us into relationship. So that first sign of the Spirit's work in our life is our faith. And our badge of belonging to the Lord is our faith in Him as God's Messiah. And as we enter into Jesus' family, we receive new life through the death of our old selves in our flesh through baptism. Paul spoke back in chapter 2, which we went through a couple of weeks ago, about being crucified in Christ, in baptism. We are clothed in Him. Now, He and anyone, all of us who have received Jesus, lives in a new life. The old life is gone. That fleshy, fleshly life that claims not only our identity and our behaviors. And it is within this framework that in another letter Paul writes, that when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. Gone are the fruits of being enslaved to the flesh, such as sexual abuse and idolatry, sorcery, drunkenness. You hear all that list that Ed read just a little bit ago? All those sordid, ugly details through which Paul lists them. And arriving in our lives is this refreshing fruit of the Holy Spirit's work. Love, joy, peace. Self-control, gentleness, kindness, kindness. Did I say generosity? Did I say, did somebody say patience? Faithfulness? Now, is there any of us who doesn't struggle with, well, let's just say, is there any of us who struggles with any of these? I'll lift my glasses to that. How about you? Lift your glasses to that. Is there anybody here who loves perfectly or practices generosity to a fault? Of course not. It's a continual work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And does that just happen in our lives, though, without any effort on our part? Paul seems to indicate here that there is a peace that we have in this process. We just don't lay down on our pillow one night after we've said a prayer, and then the next morning we awake and pow, the transformation is just incredible. No, sometimes the next day we feel just as every bit as crummy as the day before. God works in us as we make ourselves available to Him. And that is the peace that Paul calls lining up with the Spirit or being guided by the Spirit. That means that we need to get an understanding of what God's will is for us as, as His individual Christian followers and as Christian communities and then reflect on how that can come about through our actions and letting the Spirit have its way as we do that. And one piece of this, particularly in these verses, that Paul would challenge us, challenge us to focus on is what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. How would our lives, our families, our church life, and our community life experience a transformation in every action, if every response were reflected on beforehand with this question, what's the most loving thing? How can we love our neighbor through this? How can we love our neighbor who milks the system of assistance and the generosity of charities for all it's worth? How does love call us to reach out to a neighbor who has come to our door drunk again, 
begging for help because his wife has kicked him out of her. How does love call us to reach out to a neighbor who suffers from mental illness and who's violated our trust? How does love call us to reach out to a neighbor who is suffering with depression? And of course, one of the questions that's very, very hot right now and making the news headlines around our country is, what does love ask us to do to help a woman who wants an abortion? Sometimes, maybe even often, the answers are far different that we come to once we've really focused our reflection on what love calls us to do from that first response thought, that knee-jerk response that comes to us first. Love can mean diffusing road rage by exercising patience and allowing somebody to go ahead of us. That isn't easy, is it? It can mean saying a kind word instead of complaining, passing on gossip. It can mean giving generos generously to relief and development efforts to bring about social and structural changes in this world system. It can mean demonstrating and, and just demonstrating self-control in our consumer culture instead of going out and insisting on more and more things and better and better prices. In the face of the serious social ills in our communities and around the world, these small things hardly do seem like enough because we'll ask, what's one person able to do? What can one church do? Indeed, what impact can just a small community like ours have? Yet you and I have been given this gift of this wonderful gift of freedom in Christ, and we're called to use that freedom not to indulge ourselves, but to love and to care for our neighbors wherever they might be. And in response to that call, we just we just need to start right where we can with even the smallest step that we can take. When it comes to that most important commandment to love, so many of the other desires God has for us as we walk this pilgrim pathway in Christ, discerning how to line up with the Spirit, discerning how to be guided by the Spirit involves making ourselves available to God's transforming love through those timeless and tested means of grace like scripture reading, prayer, worship, sharing, and service. It's not all just a private affair. Yes, there are parts of the journey that are very enjoyable personally. In fact, we need to engage those personally and individually. Yet that's not the end of it as far as God's concerned. I heard uh, radio pastor Alistair Begg once contrast the two ends of this this way. He said there's two sorts of bodybuilders. One sort who just likes to go into bodybuilding. Just likes to do it for no other reason than the way they get to have people stare at them in the coach. That's all. Then there's the bodybuilder who's in that training room building their bodies for action. Say a football team, or maybe they're part of a rescue team. Friends, we are part of a very special team, if you will. That team is the family of God. A team that thrives only as we are serving one another in love and growing ourselves so that we in strength can help another in their weakness. Have you discovered how vital you are in that? We are to become servants of one another. Some of the translations even are stronger than that. They suggest we are to become slaves of one another through love. Here's a little test Frederick Beatner suggests. He wrote one time, If you've not cried for someone other than yourself in the past year, then chances are you're already dead. Hopefully, we're alive today. And that's a good place to start, having feelings of empathy for somebody in our church family. The phrase, though, become servants through love or become slaves through love comes across more as feelings engaged in action. And I'd suggest that we really haven't done much until we actually put our feelings into an action. Make a call. Make a pie. Write a letter. Offer comfort. Stand up for somebody whose voice isn't being heard. The whole sum of the matter is it's sort of scary when we move from the letter of the law to the letters L-O-E-E. -E. Nathan came to me just a few days ago and requested, believe it or not, that I take his training wheels off. Can you believe it? Time's finally come. I think I was probably around five or six myself, maybe a hair older, I don't know, when the, when the training wheels came off for me. But I think it was he saw Caillou. 
without training. He wanted to be like his friend Kai. Well, now he's discovering that, wow, this just isn't as easy as it looks. Not as easy as mommy and daddy and Kai who makes it look. But he's learning. He's learning that during those more difficult times, I've asked him, do you want me to put the training wheels back on? You know, it only take a few seconds to put them back on there. And he thinks about it for a moment. And I think to myself, it would be a lot easier on me if I put those training wheels back on. <laughs> wow, that's exhausting work. But uh, he sticks with what he begins. And I try to convince him to stick with it. Because I think he's going to master it soon. No longer with the training wheels. His balance will keep him up. And he'll be riding it like a master before we know it. And Paul is telling us here that the law, our training wheels, you might say, is gone. The Old Testament is now fulfilled in Jesus who fulfilled all of its intent in laying his life down for us in love so that we may be free to serve each other in love. It's easier sometimes to just wish that we could go back to more of a black and white answer to the challenges in life than to just have to live by this law of love. But as we continue in the freedom Christ wills us to live in, serving one another in love, the Spirit will continue to produce fruit in us. That's the promise of God. That's the promise of Scripture. So as we move forward in faith as a community, let's look for and draw out that fruit in ourselves and in each other and expect that our fruitfulness will be noticeable to all and a sign that we are in line with and guided by the Spirit of God. Maybe celebrate freedom each and every year. We wouldn't trade our freedom for anything. But yet sometimes we know it's challenging to live in love and serve one another.